Blood Moon Huntress, the newest graphic novel in the Dragon Prince series, gives us a lot of insight into Rayla's past. Insight that tells us a lot about how she became the person she eventually became, but not in a way that is super obvious or blunt. We already know a lot of the main facts about the transformation Rayla made. Becoming more withdrawn, more embittered, desiring much more to be the ideal warrior elf, despising humans and even becoming an assassin in order to serve the benefit of the elves, even though that's not who she really wants to be, even though it's not a role that appeals to her. It's a role that places her at odds with her basic moral impulses. Rayla is sweet. She can be a bit irascible, and she is absolutely willing to accurately put down anyone who betrays the cause of peace and justice and morality in the world. But she is a tender-hearted person who has to try and pretend that she's not. She views her compassion, her openness, her idealism, all of that as weakness. And she tries to overcome it, creating this facade of the menacing, heartless, dedicated elf who will do whatever her society needs her to do, even though that's not who she is. And she knows that's not who she is, so she's constantly struggling with that image that she is trying to project until Callum is finally sweet enough and patient enough with her that she opens up to him, and she's willing to become more broad-minded and realize that the edicts and mores of elven society are not absolute ontological truth, but just the biases and morals of a flawed society, and she can move beyond those biases and morals. She is still vehemently anti-dark magic, and she still stands up for her convictions, and she takes her role as the protector of the uh, young dragon Ozymandias very seriously. But she gradually over time accepts that she is not the person she pretended to be. But she only started acting the role of that person because she was so upset. Not just that she lost her parents, but that her parents were considered traitors that they brought shame upon themselves and her. She wants to be as different from them as possible. She is very prideful, as we see when she is consistently unwilling to talk about her past, even though it matters much more to her in terms of forming her basic sense of identity compared to Callum. So she wants to be the noble, valorized elf, she wants to uphold those ideals. She wants to be vehemently anti-human. She even wants to be an assassin for the longest time, for years and years, even though that's not organic to her basic sense of self and her basic nexus of values. But how exactly does this change come about concretely? That is what we do not know nearly as much. We know that she underwent a transformation from being a more upbeat and a little naive young girl to being a, a bit callous and very confused and conflicted teenager. And Blood Moon Huntress, beneath all its trappings of legends and myths, gives us a lot of grounded, devastating insight into how Rayla gradually undergoes that process of hardening of her disdain for her parents and her desire to prove herself 
by the standards of elven society, kind of calcifying around these sweet, compassionate girls she used to be. And knowing more about Rayla in this period immediately after the disappearance of her parents makes her story feel much more palpable and much more vibrant to the viewer. Now, I will admit that as I'm recording this, not all of Blood Moon Huntress has been released. We've just gotten some previews. But I think these previews give us enough information to allow a comprehensive take on the ideas of the novel as a whole, at least as it pertains to Rayla's gradual change and development. And I hope this video will still be of use even after Blood Moon Huntress comes out soon after its release. Blood Moon Huntress is quite subtle and yet poignant in how it handles Rayla's young fearlessness and willingness to defy the conventions and standards of elven society. Conventions that she understands but does not quite accept. And many of these standards she is wholeheartedly against. She does not accept Runan being an assassin, for instance. And she's even willing to fight with them about this and not back down even though she's just a little kid. This is so striking considering that she eventually became willing to serve as an assassin herself. We see her gradually buying more and more into these ideals of violence and this firm anti-human stance that you see across elf kind, which is quite sad, quite melancholic. But I like how tough Rayla is. I love how committed she is to her belief that being an assassin is wrong and that it cannot be justified. Runan, much less calm than Athari, does not try to soothe her. Instead, he directly engages with her, trying to prove to her that being an assassin is, while not a pretty job, often a necessary one, especially in a time of war and conflict. It's a brilliant way to demonstrate Rayla's backstory, which is a much harder task than I think a lot of people anticipate. I do not think it's a radical opinion to say that most people believe that showing a character's backstory is a good thing. Now, obviously, you don't need to show the backstory of every character, and there are characters and situations wherein being implicit about a character's backstory, giving a lot of little hints to slowly build a comprehensive picture of that backstory, are much more effective at conveying the fullness of who this character is, as opposed to, say, an entire episode or an entire graphic novel dedicated to demonstrating the backstory of the character. But whatever route you take, the basic goal is the same. To elucidate this character, to incisively and precisely bring the most important aspects of this character to the forefront. What information should be revealed? It needs to be not just random pieces of information. A lot of the worst attempts to show characters' backstories, such as Solo, a Star Wars story, focus too much on things that don't matter. Things that do not add to the basic philosophical and experiential understanding of the character. Our basic understanding of Han Solo, our knowledge of the essence, the inner truth of his character, is not expanded by knowing a bunch of random facts about him, 
We don't need to know that Solo is apparently not the name he was born with. That's not relevant information. That adds nothing. What's relevant are aspects of a character's life that are cast in shadow that we don't know, but a backstory presentation demonstrates that knowing these elements of a character are crucial to understand the person the character is now and the process by which they became that person. So what do you show in a backstory episode? Well, the most obvious answer is that you show the biggest points of the character's backstory. The main events that demonstrate how they became the person they are. For instance, with Zuko, in Zuko alone, you have the time his father almost killed him, you have the death of Lu Ten, his cousin, and you have the disappearance of his mom when she killed Azulon, allowing Ozai to ascend to the throne in return for Zuko's life being spared. All of that's important information that very much reveals a lot about Zuko's relationship with his mother and why he is carrying around this inescapable feeling of guilt and unease in a way that is much more effective than just than just trying to overtly say that, oh hey, he had problems in his past and they caused him to become quite isolated and quite anxious, especially when his mother left. Demonstrating this entire episode of his life is a much more effective way at conveying that emotional truth, that inward truth, not merely the factual material truth. But there are also tiny little episodes that can go as much to really conveying this sense of who this person was as a kid and how they steadily changed. As William James teaches us, change is not merely about one experience or one emotion or one idea completely overthrowing our sense of self. Rather, these new conceptions go and enter our already existing sense of self and we try to reconcile our new feelings, our new conceptions of the world with what we already believe and change happens slowly. Little moments in the Zuko Alone episode do this, as does much of the mundane storytelling here in Blood Moon Huntress. You can do a lot with a little, just demonstrating through Rayla's dinner table conversation with Athari and Runan that she disdains her parents and yet she really does not want to become an assassin and she loathes the idea of killing someone. It says a lot about where she is in her life. She is unmoored, she is uncertain. Rayla is in a time of complete turmoil and anxiety in her life. She has lost the two people she probably cared the most about in the world, her parents. Not only that, she now lives with the knowledge that in the eyes of elven society, they are traitors. So how does she respond to this? Again, she's prideful. She wants to defend her honor. She wants to have a sense of dignity. And if that means disassociating herself from her parents and from that more cheery, optimistic, vulnerable side of herself, that's what she's going to do. Now, Blood Moon Huntress is not a macabre or nihilistic work, far from it. But it is a work that subtly, devastatingly demonstrates Rayla in a state of transition and complete despondency after what happened to her parents as much as she tries to hide it with uh, a happy-go-lucky demeanor and she gradually changes for the worse, becoming more callous until the time where she meets Callum. So thank you all for watching. If you liked what you saw today, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Donate to my Patreon if you can and you want to see more videos like this one before anyone else. Keep watching The Dragon Prince. It is a brilliant show. 
and hopefully it will take further steps into the pantheon of legendary modern animated storytelling. Adios, comrades.